Red with the naked eye. <laughs> I don't know who you are, but welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Sit back, relax, and listen about cameras, gear, settings, stories, and all things photography. Join Darren on Ireland's Best Photography Podcast. Let's go. You're very welcome to episode 155 of the Irish Photography Podcast. My name is Darren, I'm your host, and I'm delighted to be joined by not one, but two guests on this evening's podcast. First guest, everybody will know him, probably sick of listening to him, but I don't think so, because he's going to have some fantastic stories to tell. That's Mr. Bernard Geraghty. Bernard, how are you getting on, man? I'm very, very good, Darren. How are you? Great, boy. Great. Great to finally have you on the podcast. We'll we'll del- delve into how I tried to get you on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And in a way, I'm glad that I didn't, because now you can tell me all about these stories in relation yeah. to this trip. And secondly, I'm honoured to have the one, the only, Mr. Adrian Gray join us on the podcast. So, Adrian, welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Hi, Darren. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It's um, a great pleasure. Enjoy listening to you. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Good stuff. Good stuff. I'm looking forward you- to it, too. You told me you didn't like listening to him. Oh, he's listening to him all the time, man. It's your podcast. Like listening to him. Oh, all right. Okay, okay, okay. I've never heard That's one. That's why I'm not doing it anymore. Do? Like do podcast, it? I, feel so like, look, I feel like I'm on with my father, actually. I feel like it's like Darren and it's like father and son. All right, yeah, I thought you were going to call me the father there for a second. It's okay. Yeah, Adrian, no, you I can said take father, not, not, not grandfather. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And this is what it's about. It's about the banter. It's about the crack. And that's, I'm really, really excited to have the crack and have the conversation this evening because um, let me get it right into it, right? So, Bernard, I had wanted to try and record a podcast with you, which was the Sunday Showcase. And it was just when you were after going over on a trip to the Foton. And unfortunately, things didn't line up in relation to it, so I couldn't get you on. And I'm delighted now, because like I said from the outset, you're able to tell me all about it retrospectively. Because if I got you on that first week, I think I probably would have missed out on a huge amount of stories that you're going to be able to uh, to tell. So it was, I think, the first big trip, but you also had another trip prior to that to Venice, which we had discussed when we did the, uh, the podcast around Christmas. But this was the first real big international trip and a long-term trip as well. Uh, for you so first and foremost really how did it feel to travel once again uh well i suppose um you know i was on just before christmas about how i was feeling and all that kind of you know pre post covid if you can even say post covid and how it was affecting my mental health in a way not that i was in a really dark place but um you know it's just it was such a surreal feeling to be kind of back flat out again um so I suppose kind of continuing on a little bit from that last podcast, essentially going through the same kind of motions again, where, you know, at the, I, from mid December, I had from mid mid December to mid January off. So there was that kind of lull again, where you went from seeing loads of people to seeing no one. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, given everyone was kind of keeping a low profile, COVID cases were spiking. Um, I was actually very sick for pretty much the whole Christmas period. My dog had to get a couple of op- few operations. So that kind of almost isolated me naturally. I didn't have COVID, but I just seemed to be sicker than everyone that had COVID. Mm, and then okay. kind of a, I kind of had to lean it. So I was leaving for five weeks in the Arctic um, on January 13th. So I said to myself, right, whatever amount of people I was seeing, I was still getting out and hiking and stuff like that. Um, I was testing twice a day. PCR test, antigen test, and I had not got COVID. So, um, you know, I said to myself, right, I need to set myself a timeline as to when I really see very few people before I go to Norway. Um, and I decided maybe kind of November or January in the fifth, sixth will be a right time, you know, seven, eight days before I go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was pretty much just here at home in my home place in Newbridge. And then what happened was I wasn't going to see anyone, only my parents. And then my dad got COVID and my mom had already had it. So I literally had to isolate from them. Wow. That was kind of tough. So automatically you're going into negative mode straight away. Your head is going 90. You're wondering, will the trips happen? Will you get COVID before a trip or whatever? Anyway, none of that happened. It was all good. It was the quietest and most enjoyable Christmas I've probably ever had. Um, it was absolutely amazing to have no plan um, and then prepare for five weeks in the Arctic. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And it was my first time being away for a solid five weeks, just doing trip after trip after trip. And there was, you're apprehensive, you know, will you have the energy levels? Will you have the enthusiasm? And uh, thankfully, it all worked out. Everything was just unbelievable from start to finish. Uh, tough start with weather in Lofoten um, for the first week. Unfortunately, you could say the group didn't get a roar out. I mean, a tinsy bit, but not what I would expect from a trip, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had amazing winter conditions, absolutely mm. stunning winter conditions. Um, so it started slow. But I think then from the, ter- the second week all the way up to the fifth, um, I'll, I'll let you ask more questions and we'll bring in Adrian in a few minutes to explain how, how, how that went because he had four or five days in Lofoten with me um, along then with a week on Senya Island as well. Okay, so, I mean, look, absolutely, I can understand where, you know, the apprehensiveness would come from, from the travel point of view, and particularly going away for so long as well. And I mean, look, yeah, you know, I think even from Adrian's point of view, and let's bring Adrian in in relation to this, because getting to Lofoten is not exactly very straightforward. So what was involved in you getting to Lofoten in the first instance, and how did you feel about traveling secondly? Yeah, so it involves um, three flights, basically. Um the last time with were Bernard, we took a ferry um, across from Bodo. Um, this time it was a flight, and we've done that flight before. It's in a very small aircraft, and you're always worried about fitting your camera bag on. Mm-hmm. So it was Dublin, Oslo, and then we had a stop over in Oslo, Oslo to Bodo, and then Bodo to Leknes. Um, and it's a small plane then that you have to try and get on with your camera bag from Bodo to Leknes. And unfortunately... <laughs> I can still remember um, our flight was delayed coming into Bodo and we just basically ran from one terminal or one gate to say a terminal, the place is tiny, straight across the corridor basically onto the other flight. And I can still remember walking onto the plane and just thinking, I'm going to end up on the bench seat. I'm going to end up on the bench seat because <laughs> with this plane, there's a bench seat at the very back, okay. which means if you end up in this bench seat, it's like a bus. You've nowhere to put your bag because the camera bag will not fit in the locker. Gotcha. And I just kept seeing this coming and I'm the last one on. I'm going to end up in this bench seat. So, yep, I ended up in the bench seat, camera bag in front of me, knowing, well, I'm going to end up in problems here. I can't fit the camera bag in the overhead locker. Mm -hmm. How am I going to explain this? So, of course, the the, um, the stewardess comes down to me and starts going on. You know, you need to put that in the locker. So, well, it won't fit in the locker. She said, well, you can't, you can't have it here. I said, well, you just need to ask somebody to move. I've been through this before in this flight. You know, somebody else will move if you ask them. Mm-hmm. So she said, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't take this camera bag on. You know, this bag needs to go on the hold. And I'm going, well, I can't. I'm not going to take the flight. This camera bag can't go on the hold. Mm-hmm. So she got a bit uptight or whatever, and she stormed off. And I just turned around to the guy sitting beside me. He was obviously in a window seat. And I just, you know, they all speak English anyway, and just explained the situation and said, look, the camera bag will fit in underneath your seat if we swap seats. And um, lucky enough, the guy was very accommodating and um, nice. he moved because we've been in that situation before and the same with the same airline and everything. And it shouldn't be a big deal. It's just unfortunate I ended up in this bench seat and um yeah, I had to get somebody else to move. And then she came down and gave me an honor lecture again <laughs> when after she'd done her demonstration just to make the point again, you know. But, um, yeah, so that was quite stressful. Um, I wasn't overly happy about traveling. Um, just, uh, we were just talking about that just before we started the podcast. And if for any reason at all somebody had said to me there's a reason why we couldn't travel, I would have jumped on it because... I just wasn't happy traveling, um, especially three flights one after the other. Just mm-hmm. it's going against everything that we've been sort of told for the last two years that it's not safe to travel. It's you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Um, and yeah, we have sort of followed the guidelines very strictly at work because we've got our own business and we had to try and keep it open and try and limit the number of people that are infected. So yeah, it was like your brain is it's your you're torn. That's how it felt. Like you felt like you're doing something wrong, even though, and mm. it was trying to convince yourself that this is okay. You know, it's like, it was like being on a guilt trip. That's how it felt. You were guilty, you know, of doing something. And it, is and it like you were trying to get, come to terms with what that was, you know, why do I feel this way? You know, 
Well, that, that's exactly what I was going to say to you. It's like as if it's a new conditioning that we've gone through over the last two years because it's constantly, you know, you shouldn't do this, you got to stay away from people, you shouldn't travel. And then all of a sudden things open back up again. That's not a, a switch that can be flicked overnight because it's been Im- embedded into us for so long. And I mean, even, you know, the apprehensiveness of traveling from that point of view, I'm sure, as you say, you know, you knew you were going to get the bench seat, you got the bench seat. But in fairness to the guy that you asked, I mean, if he had said no, I'm sure somebody else would have uh, accommodated you because, I mean, surely the air hostess is used to people coming on a plane with camera gear. I mean, you're, you're not going to throw the camera gear down the hole. I, I wouldn't certainly do it either. Like, you know what I mean? So I think it must have been even from you, Bernard, like you're heading over there and you're going over there for what? Was it four four trips in total? Was that? The, so it was, it was, I suppose, four and a half trips. Um, so I had two full, one, full week trips on Lofoten with two different groups. Um, and then I had a kind of five days in between where I was just going to do my own thing. And next up would have been Senya and I had Adrian and Hannah and I had Tony Haberland, Aoife Tierney and Keen Ryan. Mm-hmm. And I said to myself, like, realistically, I thrive with other people around. It's it's that simple. My motivation and enthusiasm levels for what I do are not the same without people. And that's not a bad thing because it's just I love being around people. I love buzzing off other people. So I was like, if I stay for four or five days by myself on Lafoten, I will not do half the stuff. Mm-hmm. And some people might be like, geez, that's crazy. But it's actually not. I just buzz off other people. I my I get the most enjoyment out of seeing their reactions. That is as plain and simple as that. Um, so I'd like, you know what? No better group to bring out. This is guys, do you fancy, you know, a few few days on Lafoten? You've pretty much all been here before, but do you fancy a few days? I'll do up a price. And they were like, yeah, there's a bear shit in the woods kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it gave me something to look forward to. Um, you know, like obviously the first two groups, unbelievable. Like there's just very lucky to be in a situation where I could be like one of those, you know, people that does a concert in Dublin and tells the crowd in Dublin that you're the best crowd I've ever had. And then you go to London the next week and do the same and the same and the same to, you know, whatever, whatever city you play um, may perform. But that's what it's been like with me is that every group just seems to gel so well and, and seems to be as good as the next. But no one, I suppose, a group that I'm very familiar with was no better group to really have some inverted commas downtime with. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And they would have understood if I wanted a break or anything like that. But after two solid weeks with the first two groups and then AD, Hannah and the rest of them coming out for four or five days in Lafoten, actually AD had said to me, he says, one of the things I was worried about was you're out here for two weeks now. I was wondering what your energy levels and enthusiasm levels were like. And I'll let AD kind of continue that then. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know what Bernard's like, <laughs> probably better than I do, Darn. so it doesn't take much to get him enthusiastic again. Um, but to be honest, I mean, being really truthful, I mean, I've seen a different Bernard now, and um, I suppose it was quite poignant today listening to the the, um, the podcast that you both did together about mental health. And, you know, Bernard has had a couple of conversations with me over the period and over lockdown. And, um, yeah, I, I, I totally get it that, I think everybody's lost a little bit of themselves somewhere along the way here. And Mm -hmm. it's Mm going to take a while to rebuild and become the person that we were before. And I think Bernard, you know, fair play to him, has opened up to that. And I didn't really probably think that it's affected me as much until probably went on this trip. And um, I don't know if Bernard noticed, but I just wasn't the same person that I would be normally. You know, it took me a while to... You know, just have the crack and just it sort of, ease out of it. chill and yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I definitely did. Normally, I can hit the ground running, and uh, me and Bernard strike it off, and we set the tone straight away, more or less. I thought um, we were but, falling out of love at first, you see. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I definitely um, did find it um, strange. It was, but I think we all did. I think we all found it um, funny. Um, I think it was. It was also a good time to. Um, it was also a good time to to kind of you know when you're getting back traveling. It was a good way to prepare for Senya, um, by bringing you out for a few days out to Lafoten to get you into the groove, but also to get used to the temperatures as well. Because the first yeah. few days you guys were there, it wasn't that cold, but mm. you felt it though. Yeah, yeah, no, we definitely did. Darn, um, I can still remember the first morning we were shooting, and Hannah was um not interested really. We just me and Bernard looked at one and just thought, well. 
what's going on here if this is the way this is going to start <laughs> it's not going to work out very well as a trip and um we didn't know what was going on but it was just the cold we just hadn't been used to this at all we hadn't done a trip like this in two years and we were just not accustomed to being out in those temperatures even as Bernard says it wasn't that cold but for us it was cold so know? it was minus five when you got to Lofoten yeah so you were expecting it to be cold and I know we'll talk about real cold later on but I mean minus five is not a nice temperature for ordinary person if you want to call it that that's used to creature comforts and home comforts i mean you know our winters as everybody knows in ireland you know you might get zero degrees and it might be between zero and 10 degrees zero being the worst and 10 being a bammy winter let's just say so to go to those conditions surrounded by snow and minus five what was the first reaction that you had was like jesus what if i put myself in for this is absolutely freezing or was it like jeez bird it's fairly cold here right like no i think um yeah I was trying to put a brave face on it, but um, Bernard being Bernard took us up the waterfall up the side of a mountain straight away, and it's either <laughs> it's either you get in straight away or just um, <laughs> sink or swim. This is what it's all about, guys: sink or swim. Yeah. So, and um, we followed him up the side of this river, and um, he was being his usual enthusiastic self and trying to get everybody motivated, and we were like almost shell shocked, to be honest. Well, and um, yeah, it was. That's the only way I can describe it, and. You know, it's just the temperatures and just everything and just all these confusing thoughts going on in your head that you shouldn't be here. Or this is not right. Mm -hmm. And then you're suffering, really. I mean, a fellow were really suffering that first day of the cold. Mm. And, um, yeah, but I think what it was, um, we weren't, yeah, we didn't really prepare fully because we weren't really, there's no set itinerary as such. But then it's a burner tour. We just go and do things and whatever is the right thing to do at whatever time. He just, he goes by his gut instinct and, we're all very happy about that, and that's what works, and that's what makes a burner trip really special. Um, so, yeah, that first day was massive shock to the system. I mean, and we've experienced, I mean, we've done Senya before Bernard, and we've hiked up Segla, and, you know, that was really, really, really cold. That was brain freeze cold. Um, but this felt the same, even though the temperatures were nothing like the same at all, mm. because we're just so unaccustomed to it. And, and Bernard, I suppose, you know, what type of weather did you have? You mentioned there a second ago, the first, you know, the first week for the first uh, workshop group was not ideal conditions, let's just say. But over the course of the trip on the fort and anyway, what type of weather did you have? Well, so the first kind of trip, like when I say it wasn't ideal, it just wasn't ideal for Aurora. Simple as that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm a believer in, I see, I see some people saying, oh, I have 100% record with Aurora and stuff. Like that doesn't make you any better of a photographer or a guide. At the end of the day, you look at the weather, see what the chances are. You might be in an area of clearance and you might not. It's just look at the draw. Mm -hmm. It's happened many people where you don't go and you, you go and you don't get it. Mm -hmm. Um, The weather was just very bad. And I, I had looked to, you know, places five, six hours from Lofoten because I would have I would have drove that to, 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 you know, for a night to get clients Aurora because that's the that's where the memories are made. But the, the forecast just wasn't in it. No matter where you were in Norway, it just wasn't happening. Um, but we had good landscape photography weather in terms of like the, you know, lovely light powdery snow with gales blowing and creating, you know, this, this, this drama with snow blowing through these images and landscapes and mountains, you know, lone trees popping out, beautiful mood on the, on the seas and stuff like that. So in terms from a landscape point of view, it was absolutely perfect. Um, and we had a lovely amount of snow and stuff like that. Um, so that was fine. So temperatures were kind of hovering then around kind of anything from about two or three degrees down to minus four or five. Um, and then the second group arrived. And the second group, we did get a few nights of Aurora and stuff like that. But I tell you one thing about the second group, um, which, you know, there's a good few listeners um, of, of the podcast were on that. And actually one of them was Paul O'Brien. Mm -hmm. Such a nice guy. And, and Jesus, like the edits he's banging out from these these trip this this trip was just unreal but he was on the second Lafoten group and they arrived on the thursday night and then the friday morning we went out and we went hell for leather and i swear to god i don't think i've seen a day of more pristine co color light conditions ever in nice. landscape photography like nice. every we we went to five places that day given how short the days are we went to five places and it was light reflections, all sorts of mood, all happening in the one day. And I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, mm. So that really got that group off to a good start, you know, that, that like, and, and 
the, the first actually group got off to a great start with kind of reflections as well. But just this particular day was just mental. You know, the whole five weeks, this was just... If 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 Carlsberg did days of landscape <laughs> photography, this was it. Yeah. And then that night, we got the Aurora. And we got the Aurora a few nights with them. So temperatures were still hovering. But the winds on Lofoten for the first two weeks were incredible. Northerly winds bringing down the cold. And that's that wind chill getting down. So it, could, it was hard to deal with at times. But that's what you expect when you go up to these places, you know. Um, but all in all, I would call the first two trips very successful. Um, like the best winter conditions I've ever seen on the first trip. And then, you know, that that first day on the second trip with the with the conditions was just magical. And then we'd have a couple of nights of Aurora for the next week as well. And that really continued until when AD and, and the rest of the gang came out to Lofoten mm. uh, for my, I suppose, inverted commas, third trip uh, mm-hmm. to Lofoten. But the light we had on that third trip was just something like you wouldn't see. It was just crazy. These mountain peaks lit up. Like light you've never seen before, and and it would only happen in the Arctic. You know, what I mean, it just it would only happen in the Arctic. And there was kind of one thing that stands out as good as the light was, and we got Aurora with with the gang again on this trip. Um, the one standout moment for that was your the pressure's not on so much there because you know you have six a week of of of, of Arctic conditions coming up in Senya after this. But we actually were at this lovely spot. We went down this little road just by chance, and we said, let's have a look and see. And it's this little, there was this little, you know, um, uh, like, it's about six or seven of these red cabins in a little village. And th- it was almost like um, this little community of expats, people from Finland, Sweden, the UK, and th- there was three or four of them around this little fire outside. Okay. So it was the middle of the day, and they waved at us, and we waved at them, and we pulled in, and we seen this untouched, beautiful snow really lovely texture in the snow then lovely fjord with boats and then these class mountains big one at the start and then slowly getting smaller and smaller and then the light was incredible and i remember one of the guys was going in to his cabin he lived at the cabin right beside where we were shooting and i was joking and i shouted out oh you know uh tea tea, tea no sugar kind of thing you know joking <laughs> and he laughed and he, he got the joke and next thing he arrives out with a flask of tea and whiskey wow. <laughs> and nice. we're we're sitting there for about an hour, an hour and a half shooting sunset, and this guy, random guy that we don't know, comes out with like tea and whiskey and gives us tea and a little little dab of whiskey. And like you you forget about the photography then. Those are the little things that make a trip and those are the things that give you even that absolutely. extra buzz then to do better again, you know? Mm, absolutely. And you know what? It's stuff like that that stick with people as well outside of the photos. I mean, it's the people yeah. you meet. It's the unexpected situations that you find yourself in. And they're effectively become, like you say, you know, the highlight in relation to the, the trip and stuff like that. And I mean, you mentioned about going on to, you know, when AD arrived and such and the rest, rest of that group. So Adrian, what was your uh, highlight of the Fulton for your part of, of, of that trip? Um, yeah, probably, you know, what Bernie just after describing there, but again, we're sort of a bit torn because the male brain doesn't seem to work the same as the female brain. So True the story. females were sitting in the mini bus, sort of glaring out at us as if, what are you guys shooting? Mm-hmm. We're going, <laughs> you know, this fantastic scenery that Bernie's just after describing. <laughs> and, you know, you, you get that sometimes and, um, you know, yeah, it's it's just strange. We were laughing about it at the time, just the way the females see things and the way males see things sometimes just don't gel at all. And mm. um, they came and looked at what we were shooting and just walked off in disgust. <laughs> and we were like, <laughs> what is going on here? You know, but yeah, probably for me, the um, the highlight of the Fulton was um, the blizzard conditions at the Red Hut in um, Ramberg because it just transformed me right back to two years previous when we'd been there before. It was the last trip that I'd done before lockdown and it was um it was full of Chinese at the time mm-hmm. and the Chinese were all being called home. So all the whenever we flew home, the flight was full of Chinese. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So yeah, that transformed me straight back there um at the time, um, which was quite poignant. Um and then the conditions we got were very similar to the, the previous time as well, which um, was really strange. But I don't know, something inside sort of said, yeah, it's okay to be here. You've been here before. You know, it just seemed like this was the exact same time we were there two years ago. We got the blizzard conditions. We got the wind 
driven snow and me and Bernard were the last one shooting, which was, I think, the same <laughs> the last time we were there. And then we walked back together to the minibus and just sort of inside, I don't know, something clicked and just said, yeah, this is going to be okay. It's okay to be here sort of thing, which, which was nice, you know. So, Bernard, you know, one of the things that I've known and I've traveled with you when we went to the Dolomites is that you have an uncanny knack for finding uh, unknown areas or small little areas with some incredible snow patterns and such like that. Now, Adrian, you mentioned that when you first arrived there, Bernard brought you up this river and then found some beautiful shapes. And I saw those images, Bernard, when you would have shared them online and stuff like that. So tell me, what did you find on this trip? What unusual snow patterns did you find for the guests this time? Well, I suppose if we're still on Lofoten, you know, it's it, like Lofoten's quite easy to find those like beautiful patterns. Um, you know, ev everything in Lofoten's pretty accessible. Um, I talk when you go out to Senya then, Senya's quite similar to Lofoten, but it's it's more wi wild, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I I in general like up around that river and stuff like that was just stunning. And and it's it, it's a well-known spot to some people if you're kind of half fit, it's not it's not that bad of a jaunt up but it's always worth walking up because you never know you never know what you're going to find and it's great actually because when we went on the trip um a few months previous i'd said to ad you know like with lenses ad's a sony user as well and i was like listen this 12 24 uh g the f4 or the f2.8 whichever i have the f4 one i said is a game changer for landscape photography in terms of getting close to things and um, I think you bought it, AD, a few months ago, but it was only when you got to Lofoten you realised, wow, this lens is a game changer. Yeah, I never actually got to use it. Bernard was the first time I actually took it out of the, the case almost, you know, and never ever used it before. Um, but it, it, just, it just allows you to, like, having that wide angle, you know, in, in them kind of scenarios, it allows you sure. to get very close to water, like, and use every little inch of this possible you know, pattern or line in the snow, you know, especially if you have water mixed in, you can create really nice images. And the good thing with like a 12 mil lens is, um, so you can get real close, but if, you, if you're in portrait mode and you tilt that camera down a bit, the more you tilt down to get closer to your foreground subject, the more the mountain will actually spike up in the back. Yeah. You know, so yeah. which, which is also gives a great effect. Um, I suppose in terms of, you know, like any kind of real unusual conditions, they really started, um, in 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 Senya when we got to Senya then, okay right we'll park Senya now because we're going to get to part two and I yep. can't wait to hear all about that. I have two two other final questions I suppose in relation to Lofoten and the first one is to you Adrian right. So most people I've never been to Lofoten and it's it's been a running joke on the podcast. I was supposed to go to Lofoten and never got to go there uh, at the time, but I can't wait to get there eventually anyway right. But most people when they're there you know they're taking the photograph on the bridge and they're taking the photographs of these beautiful red cabins so picturesque and everything else, but you guys actually stayed in the red cabin. So what's it like to, to stay in that area? I mean, you walk out the door and you've got beautiful water, ridiculously high mountains all around you. And they're lovely and warm as well, especially in relation to the cold. So like, are they a great place to stay? Yeah, it's, it's really heaven for landscape photographer. I mean, I mean, I don't see how anybody could ever get tired of looking at that. Mm. Um, mm. But Bernard, funny, when we were there and we were shooting on the bridge, I think Bernard said that, you know, quite, well, we know the guy, he's been on Clubhouse and he's a famous enough photographer, um, commented on Bernard and said, would you not try and go somewhere else? And, you know, it's Bernard had a very good um, way of, um, you know, replying to that, um, which is right. I mean, everybody has a job to do and we all turn up to an office. It's the same place you turn up to every day. Mm -hmm. But Bernard gets to to go and shoot these amazing vistas, which, yeah, he's not at the red cabins every single day, but when he is there, I mean, of course, if you're going to get nice light on, on the mountains behind the red cabins with the red cabins in the foreground and the sea, and yeah, of course, it's perfect from a landscape photography point of view. I don't, I don't know how anybody and could get what, tired of looking at that. Th this is the thing. So what you have, uh, Darren, what he's talking about is you have people messaging you and, you know, they're like, oh, just that bloody, you know, them cabins again. And my response to these people is, the, the number one, right, most of these people who would have, you'd be saying, oh, why are you at them cabins? Like, why do people always go to these cabins, right? I don't think you'll have to delve back too far into their Instagram or website 
see that at some stage these people shot these shots as, before themselves mm-hmm. and because they've shot it they almost feel like no one else should shoot it and it's like oh it's just your typical cliche landscape but at the end of the day if you're someone that works nine to five and this is your just hobby and you you don't get to travel much of course you're going to want to go here you've never been here before mm-hmm. like of course you're going to want to shoot it but because some person who shot it two or three times before and is sick of it now you know that means they're sick of it so you, you have to be sick of it too mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I, the argument i always have is you know is like one guy in particular was like oh it's like that bridge my god and i'm like but sure like it makes people happy it brings them lovely memories Absolutely. and he said true enough and i asked him what he worked at and he told me and i asked him how long has he been doing it and he told me and i said how long have you been with the same company and he told me and i'm like so you're with this company eight years doing this but mm-hmm. i go and shoot these landscapes for a living but like if you're with this company for eight years how do you not hate your job mm-hmm. like am i because you've been there day in day out for the last eight years should i tell you that your I hate your job. Do you know but what I mean? The, I do, but you know what the other side of it too is that I mean, look, you're you're a leader of a group. You want to bring people to places that th- they look good for a reason. They're nice photographs for a reason, and it's not that you've seen it ten thousand times. They haven't, and they haven't had their own image of that. And if you didn't bring them to that area, then they'd probably feel, why didn't you bring me to the red cabins? That was a shot that really attracted me to go to that area. So of course. Absolutely. Look, you, they're, they're honeypot locations for a reason because they're nice, they're good. And as Adrian said, you know, how could you get sick of looking at that? Because you don't see it every day. And I mean, like for, for someone to say that to, to you, and I think from you of all people, I suppose, you know, it's the last question I have for you, actually, is like you are famous for not having an agenda, not having an itinerary. You will bring your group to where the right conditions are with the right light to the location that matches that. And you will move on a dime. You will, you know, that's, we got to go, we got to go now because it's going to be in a certain different area. So if you were fixed and fixated on sitting in that one area, which a lot of people are, and they don't have the ingenuity to find that other location to match the light, then you'd get a nice location in mediocre light. But I think with you, what you do is that you will get incredible light and an unusual location which complements the light. So with that in mind, like how much running around, how much fastness of movement did you have to do in the photo with the group on this time? And how much did you have to draw on the arsenal of areas that you have in your bag to be able to bring people to to match that light? Um, so I think like Lafoten's a great place. Listen, there's not too many hidden lo- locations in Lafoten anymore, to be honest. Um, it's just trying to get a unique perspective of something. And, you know, that waterfall that we, we were shooting and stuff the first trip actually you know, one of the guys that lives on Lafote and seeing my story and was like, wow, that S curve is just perfect. I've never seen a composition like that there, which is nice. You've mm-hmm. made a unique image because of the way the ice was and the river start flowing when it start icing over. It created this S curve that's never there. Mm-hmm. So that's an example of creating a unique image from a popular place or whatever. But kind of it was one day where we did chase around um, on Lafote and almost like headless chickens because you had these razor sharp peaks with this beautiful Arctic light, but mental mood behind. And we went to two or three different locations to shoot these with long lenses. And mm-hmm. it was, it was, it wasn't, you know, too much associated with Lafoten. You know, now Stevie Wonder could have seen the shots. Do you know what I mean? Like there okay. were these lovely peaks with dark clouds behind them and these peaks were lit up. So it, it, it was there. You just needed a 70 to 200 to shoot them all. Mm-hmm. And it was incredible, but that was probably one of the best memories um, of that part of the trip was, chasing these unusual shots that you know unless you really 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 know Lafoten they could be from Lafoten they could be from Patagonia they could be from Italy you know that mm-hmm. kind of way mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. But in terms of Lafoten like there's not really that like the best thing about the best way to shoot Lafoten from a u- unique perspective is to go in the summer and spend the week in the mountains and I did that back in 2019 and it's a whole other ball game a whole other ball game you know, we recorded the podcast from the top of that mountain that time. We did actually. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I think, listen, Lafoten is unreal. Like it is out of this world. And I feel anyone that goes to Lafoten should then follow up by Senya. Mm. Um, I think I would always do, I would, uh, if, if someone said to Bernard, I want to do the two of them, but which will I do first? Um, and Adrian would probably agree with me. I would say do Lafoten first and get whatever you want there and see these famous spots and then go to Senya and see the magic of Senya. And I think now is probably a perfect time to move on to them trips because there's so much to talk about, you know, from 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 them trips alone. 
Well, just as per your recommendation, we'll follow along with that. So on that bombshell, we'll take our break and we'll be right back with the fantastic stories that are to come from the trip to Senya. So yeah, we'll be right back after this. If you're enjoying this episode of the Irish Photography Podcast, why not jump back and listen to the back catalogue we have of episodes, where you'll get some great insights from fantastic guests, gear reviews, lots of hints and tips, and above all else, keeping you company while you drive or relax. Thanks very much for listening. Please consider subscribing, leaving a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And you're very welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast. So, right, guys, onwards to Senya now. Now, Adrian, right, we mentioned about it being cold in Lofoten. Then it got a small little bit colder in Senya. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, I don't know when. Well, Bernard been um, <laughs> being Bernard when we were in the Foden, he kept going on to. He was very excited about the forecast. Was showing we we're going to get minus eighteen whenever we were going to arrive in the Senya, and he was very enthusiastic about this. And <laughs> I think the rest of us were all looking at one another going, my God, we think minus five is cold. And he's enthusiastic <laughs> about heading into minus 18. So, um, yeah. yeah, I know that everybody else in the group key and everybody was like, oh, my God, you know, this is going to be a shock to the system. Um, Can I go yeah, back so for a when... second? Can, sorry for interrupting. Can I go back for a second? Yeah. Just really quick. Sorry, Eddie. So, Darren, what he means is go back to Lafoten just for two seconds. Yeah. I was keeping an eye on the weather for Senya. Sorry, in I didn't the explain Fulton, that. Yeah. Um, on Windy, windy.com. And I was like, for three or four days, like, oh my God, next week's minus 17, minus 18, minus 17, minus 18. And I kept going on and on and on and on about it. So you prepared them for that. Mm. But then what we got, you couldn't prepare for. Continue. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I didn't um, give it the backdrop properly. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think generally when you look at Tromso and I do you think that's Senya, Senya, but then, you know, we know that Tromso to Senya is, what, another two and a half hours, hours and, you know, the, the difference in the climate is just, it's unbelievable. Even from, Bernard went to the shop one day and the difference in temperature between going to the shop, which was only a good 20 minutes in the, in the car, Bernard was, what, yep. minus 11 so, at the shop and minus so, 30 at the house. So we right. had... Basically, what happened, right? We had our first night um, on Senya, and it was, you know, it was cold. We knew it was going to be cold, um, but then, so we had a great, we had a lovely guest of honor for a, a few nights, um, Adrian Maudui, who's obviously frequented this podcast before, uh, Nightlights Films. Cannot, and Adrian's going to bloody drool all over him now in a second, but he's just an absolute master of conditions. Like he's just unreal, and I, I'm delighted to say I've learned so much from him. But he rocked down. He was coming to stay for a couple of nights because he gives us these lovely Aurora talks and he brings us out and he explains everything got to do with the Aurora and it makes the experience um, even a whole lot better. But he came anyway. We were all inside for the few hours and he came and he says, wow, guys, it's so cold. It's like minus 25 outside or 20, 20 outside or something like that. And we're like, what? No way. Anyway, we went out that night into the car and here it says minus 23, minus 24, minus 25, minus 26. And we went down. So what happens was this shop that Adrian's talking about is just down by the fjord. It's down by seawater. It's 20 okay. minutes away, but where we were staying was right beside the frozen freshwater lake in oh, okay. the absolute wilderness of mountains. So where we were got down to minus 30. And then going from there down to the shop one day, it went from minus 30 to minus 10. So you had a 20 degree difference Bam, in mate. 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but like you know that it, it, it's it you're able to deal with it but when you're actually outside then we're shooting in this for four or five hours a night mm. and it was incredible i've never experienced anything like it um beard was freezing instantly tripods were freezing everyone was obviously freezing um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was just it's the it first crazy. time actually we realized that um bernard is human so even Bernard was feeling the cold. Even Bernard had gloves on, and we were all looking at one. God, this is cold. Bernard's actually, yeah, Bernard's the actually crocs. dressed up. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't wearing his crocs. crocs. He was actually <laughs> feeling the cold. It's the first time. That that was probably the highlight of the trip. Bernard is human. Bernard feels the cold too, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> and come here. You you mentioned there a second ago. You know about uh, this trip, and you mentioned about Aurora, right? So, um. We'll talk about Adrian in a moment, uh, Adrian Modi, but tell me in relation to the activity that you had. I mean, man, your timing for this trip was just gifted. I mean, there was incredible Aurora activity. Have you ever seen anything 
as strong as that in all the times you photographed Aurora or as consistent as that as well? Um, so when, you know, the first night was the activity was low enough, but we went out with Adrian and again, it's just nice to have him there. And all of a sudden he's like, right guys, keep an eye south. Next thing, bang, south erupts. They're, okay, keep an, an eye west. Bang, five minutes west erupts. Everything he says just happens, you know. If he told the waters to part, they would part. <laughs> um, so that was kind of a, a, a good start. And I think we went then the next night with him as well. And that just happened again. But it wasn't really, I think, until the third night. Um, and we got it pretty much every, we got it every night on this trip. But the third night then, Adrian was gone back. And then, you know, it was solely up to me. Now, listen, Jesus, don't get me wrong. I can predict weather and Aurora. But, you know, when Adrian's just done an amazing job, you know, the pressure's on you a little bit to deliver, you know, yourself without the help of Adrian. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was kind of a case that, right, guys, something could happen early tonight. We need to be in a position uh, literally directly after sunset. And we shot sunset at the Dragon's Teeth. And the Dragon's Teeth, if you don't know, it's hard to explain, but basically mountains that are like Dragon's Teeth almost that make a lovely backdrop to a lovely seascape image. Mm -hmm. So we shot sunset there and the light was just absolutely magic. So we decided then to, uh, after sunset, go food, go for food like 10 minutes away, um, get food as quick as we can and come back to the, the, the dragon's teeth. So we went for food and we got back out and it wasn't even blue hour. Like, you know, this, it takes time to get dark there because it's so far north. Mm -hmm. um, the sun moves at a very slow pace. But like we walked out and it was like dark. It was, it was, the sun was set about 45 minutes and all we're seeing is this green all over the sky and it's still bright like literally bright. So of course we call him a created around then back to the dragon's teeth, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, safely, you know, <laughs> like you can That's drive at a normal speed here, even though the roads are in bits because you have your, 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 your studs or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, we got back to the dragon's teeth anyway, and you could see there's the sunset glow in behind the whole scene. Yet we're all there, you know, on the, on the, on the rocks and the beach. And it's just, all over the sky, green wow. all over the sky. And it was just so surreal. It was, it was, you know, two, 300 ISO, you know, seascape images for a second or two seconds with Aurora seascape water and sunset happening in the back almost. Wow. It was just unbelievable. And I suppose I'll let AD take over then um, from, I suppose what happened then, you know, when we kind of felt we'd shot that because we didn't want, if we were at that location when the activity really kicked off, it would have been too high in the sky. Um, so that was time to move. So I let AD maybe take the, the next one and to, to what happened then later that night. Sure. Yeah, so we went from there and we weren't really sure what we well we weren't really sure what was happening or where we we're gonna go after that. So we just started making our way, which wasn't too far to go to this um viewpoint which is up the side of this mountain. It's quite high up. And um day when we got up there just things just started happening almost straight away, Bernard didn't and mm. But we didn't realize, I mean, it was very, very windy. It hadn't been windy when we were down shooting at the sea. Um, and then when we got up there, we just realized there was a storm coming in and it really was windy. And with that, it was very, very cold. So the wind chill was very, was very bad. But um, yeah, the aurora really, we thought we'd seen a good display down at the at the shore. And then um, we realized with um, <laughs> once Bernard started got going that um, this was something special. and. Um, yeah, we were shooting just non-stop then. Just, you had to hold on to your tripod. You just couldn't think because the wind got that strong. Um, it really was, you just could not let go of anything. And the display in front of us was just it's the best I've ever seen. And at the time, Bernard said as well, I don't think he'd ever seen anything any better. But then again, he bettered that again a few days later with um, Adrian again. But um, yeah, it was just, the aurora was just really this this is a big area. We're looking down at this fjord, and I don't know how far across it is, but it's a big area, and the whole sky was just dancing wow. um, with color. It was just incredible. But it, it just danced all night, like it was, and and so like Lennon Ritchie, literally yeah. all night long. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, we actually left. We had left the scene because you know. The wind was really getting that strong and it was really, really cold at this stage. And we'd been out for about an hour and, you know, it was an amazing scene. But, <laughs> you know, we decided to, to leave it, which, you know, it's very, very hard to do. Mm -hmm. But when you've shot something so much, I mean, 
it's like a, I think we were, it's, it's like that shot when you're, I think Mike Snap was listening to his podcast and when you're shooting um, waves with trying to get the long exposure shots at the waves, you always just want that. Well, it's just going to be another one. It's just the next one's going to be better. The next one's going to be better. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like that with the Aurora, you're waiting for it to kick off again. And, you know, maybe the next one's better. Maybe the next one's better. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's again, it's one of those moments in life that you're always going to cherish. And I've had quite a few of those with Bernard at this stage. So, um <laughs> And and speaking of moments to cherish, I mean, we've mentioned a second ago, you know, you got the opportunity to spend some time with the incredibly talented master of Aurora, Adrian Modi, a.k.a. Nightlight Films. Adrian, tell us, what was it like uh, getting the masterclass from Adrian and sharing his knowledge and his presentation on the Aurora? And then not only that, but then seeing it afterwards with your own two eyes. Yeah, this is the second time I've met Adrian. We're very fortunate. The last time we were in San Diego with Bernard, we met him then as well. I mean, the guy's just an absolute gent. Um, you know, he's very humble. Um, you know, but everything he says, you just hang on every word because it means something. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. He doesn't just talk for the sake of it. He's just. He's not one of those type of people. When he says something, you know, it's worth listening to. Mm-hmm. Um, we're very lucky he came and. Um, he gives a video um, demonstration or display of um, it's one of his, it's his, his webinar talk that he does and gives to people to try and get, I think it's more for tour leaders, people like Bernard and that he would, he wants everybody to understand the Aurora better so they can give a better experience for people who come to Nor- Norway and expect to get that experience and understand it more and, you know, try and read the apps and read, you know, what you can, you know, the stats and, what you can expect to achieve from this, that, and the other. And he went through the whole sense of it, which I think he was surprised that we were able to keep up with it. Um, I'm from like a scientific background myself. So okay, able to follow what he was, what he was trying to say and the magnetic fields and how they affect the charged particles and why they need to be negative. And because of the, the North South pole and the direction of magnetic flux and all that sort of stuff. So, I think he was a bit surprised that we'd kept up with him and we were asking quite intelligent questions. <laughs> well, Minus me, by the way. Yeah. Minus me. I, yeah. I'm, I'm I not just going to say, yeah. And I, yeah like, <laughs> like, just ev- everyone else except me. <laughs> but that, that's a funny thing, Darren, isn't it? That, you know, I'm from the scientific background and I would understand and um, I was able to keep up with most of what he was talking about just from a theory point of view. But then it's okay having theory and um, okay knowing all that knowledge in your head somewhere. But can you really use it when the chips are down? And that's the difference, really. It's 100% just, you know, you can have all the theory in the world, but, you know, Bernard gets a roar and Bernard gets conditions and Bernard can read what's going on. And um, that's what makes a difference. But you have an Adrian there. I mean, it's just, I don't know, you can't, you can't explain what this guy's like. Can't. Um, I mean, he's completely different approach than Bernard. Um, um, but it's great that you have it's like two total different contrasts. You know, two total different people, both top of their game, um, but for very different reasons. Like Bernard would never do be able to do what Adrian can do, and I don't mean that in any condescending way. I think Bernard knows that, and vice versa. Adrian could not do what Bernard could do. But mm. it was great to see these two people gel. With in a common is... in a common entity, which is the aurora, the conditions, the love of being out shooting this. It was fantastic to see that, how these mm-hmm. two guys who are total polar opposites, really. If if you North want to look at them. Yeah, <laughs> polar <laughs> opposites, yeah. <laughs> aurora Borealis versus Aurora Astralis. Go on, yeah. Seconds away. <laughs> Very good, Darn. Um but yeah, I mean that's that was really nice to see and how these two guys gel together. Um and they really are completely different characters altogether. And and this is the beauty of it, of it as well. Like I've been become quite quite good friends with Adrian over the years, you know. Um and, and Darren, like what I said in the last podcast I did with the, uh, you know, using social media, stop giving out about it, stop moaning about Agreed. algorithms. I would not know Adrian Maudoui if it wasn't for Instagram. So there you go, bang. That is one amazing reason to be on social media. Um, the Adrian's Adrian Gray, AD, it, I, I define him by AD is Adrian that we're talking to now and Adrian is Adrian Maudoui. So, um, 
Yeah, so myself and Adrian are two totally different characters. Like, I would find myself to be street smart, where definitely, you know, Adrian is, like, pure book smart. Like, he's he's just a genius. Um, But we collaborate so well, and it just always works out like a dream. And And the best way I can describe our relationship is, so if we kind of move on to the maybe the second trip, but we, we'll just talk about Senya in general. Um, so basically, while I still had Adi and Hannah and Keen and uh, Aoife and Tony, um, my three of my four of the second group arrived um, and the three women arrived together to stay for a few days early. But I was still with the first group. So gotcha. I knew one night there was a chance of Aurora and I didn't want the women to miss out. So I said, guys, do you want me to organize a workshop? And they were like, please, please, please. So got in touch with Adrian. Will you do a workshop? Gave a price. So they were delighted. Mary, one of the women, she's just obsessed with Adrian. So it was a dream come true for her. Okay. She wouldn't be too interested in the science, but she just loves Adrian. And she like does his Patreon and all that kind of stuff and always has. And they were delighted. I got them a workshop. And like it was supposed to run for like six hours. And, you know, he, he went out of his way. And I think they were out for seven or eight hours. Brought them like literally two hours away to get them this Aurora, which they got. And not only that then, and, and, and with us as well, when he comes, unbeknownst to ourselves, we're all there shooting Aurora and being excited. And he's behind the scenes videoing everything, everything. And then a day or two later, after being with them, he emails them this video. Here, guys, here you go. And it's time lapse and it's real time and it's them so, being excited and shouting and roaring. And like, it's just, he's just a master um, of his craft and he's just so good with information. And, and that's why it works so well. And so, you know, I, I get him to come with us on, on these trips. And at the discretion of, of, of all the groups, I say, guys, listen, it, I think Adrian's proved his worth here. Um, you know, so I think we have to give him something or whatever. And I, at, up to the discretion of, of everyone, they, they have no problem dipping into their pockets to, to give this lad exactly what he's worth. And that's the beauty of it. Um, mm. There's no structure plan because you can never tell what the weather's going to be like in advance. There's no point in him coming from Tromso to send you if the weather is brutal. Thankfully, it wasn't brutal and he came out so much. But everyone, by the time they'd finished listening to him, was like, Jesus, like, tell us how much. We'll give you whatever you want kind of thing. But mm-hmm. he didn't even want anything, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and you couldn't let him leave without giving him, you know, exactly what he's worth. And to, to the extent it really kind of hit home with me how good we get on and how good of a relationship we have. So, you know, he'd making these videos. And I remember one day I said, Adrian, would you mind emailing me that? I'd love to share it on my Instagram um, and obviously credit you. And he just says, his response in a voice message was this, and I was worried at the start. It was, let's get one thing straight. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Have I said something? And he goes, whatever is mine is yours. Wow. There you go. And he says, you've helped me so much over this because we've helped each other out over COVID and stuff. You know, we both had tough COVID and stuff, so we helped each other out, both financially and, you know, from a friendship point of view. Absolutely. And that's, you know, there's so much respect there. For a guy like this who has had work in planet earth and netflix and bbc and you know all over the world to say to me bernard don't even ask yeah tell me to give it to you don't even ask i i still would ask but for him to say that is just oh um, it's mind blown like it's mind blown and it's just it's amazing it's a measure of the man you know i mean look when i had him on the podcast it was a pleasure to talk to him i wasn't talking to him about aurora i was talking to him about nfts and even the amount of information that he prepared for that was yeah. incredible you know so i mean look absolutely and i think it is the absolute pleasure to spend the time with him and i think it is something that hopefully when i do go to norway that i will end up you know meeting up with him as well because i i think i'm fascinated by how people study and not only study but master but then not only that but be able to teach mm. and be able to teach it in a way that somebody can understand it that it's not all just scientific talk there is scientific talk to back it up, but it's in the way that somebody can actually understand that as well. And I think, you know, um, the one thing that struck me was uh, the video that he had done. Uh, he had some incredible uh, light in a place, Bernard, again, picking a spot for people to spend the time in Senya, the house that you picked. It was like a dream come true. I mean, you know, the back garden was just incredible. So like Kean got some phenomenal shots of the tree that was um, folded over and everything else. And I mean, and Adrian was there as well, and I could see that. So describe this uh, accommodation that you had uh, had picked. Adrian, do you want to take this? Yeah, I can take it. Yeah, this is the second time we stayed in 
we call it Tommy's Tommy's house. Tommy's gaff. We, yeah, we call it different things, but um, yeah, we'll not go into that now. Um, yeah, so um, this place is unique um, because it's got its own river and that right down the, the back garden, and it's got these beautiful trees and that um, down the back garden, and there's this lovely garden hut. Um, it doesn't sound very good, but it's it's glazed all the way around. It's um, hexagonal sort of shape. Um, it's got a fire pit in the middle, and it's just a fantastic place to get the fire going. And when it's minus 25, minus 30 outside, and once you've been out in that for about an hour and a half, you come into this, and you don't really warm up, but um, you're not in that minus 25, minus 30. There's still ice on the inside of the windows, and uh, <laughs> it's um, that's when you realize it's cold. And when you're inside with the fire on, you can still see your own breath. And um, right. even if you put your hands right up into the fire, you basically, you know, you're still not really feeling feeling the heat. So that's sort of temperatures we were in. But um, yeah, this place is really special. It's in special location, special um, place for shooting. You don't really need to go anywhere. Um, you just go down to the river. I mean, the first it was the first morning burner, wasn't it? If you can correct me, that um, we got the winter wonderland conditions that yeah, Adrian. And um, Adrian was there, and um, we we're very lucky that he captured it on on video. And I mean, he's got it up on YouTube now, Darren. I think he yeah. calls it Winter Wonderland too. Yeah. yeah, it's unreal. And that just shows you the conditions we were shooting that morning. I mean, it's almost one of these mornings that you don't even really want to shoot it. You just want to take it all in. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. But the beauty just... is that you've got your camera, so you can relive it again there afterwards, and also yeah. you can watch the video of the time lapses and everything else that Adrian has made to kind of reminisce and get those exactly. feelings back and feel the cold again just yeah. even though you're looking at the screen you know exactly how cold it and was that, that's what probably is really special about it the fact that adrian was there to capture it. you have the master there capturing those conditions and you'll always remember it because of 100%. how well he captured it yeah. like we and try with still photographs but to be honest you don't you just can't take it in with a still photograph his his um i think there were um it was video it was um, real-time video most of the shots he was doing, wasn't it, Bernard? Yeah, and the thing about it is, so how it's a running river, you have minus 20, minus 30 degrees temperature. The reason it's still running is because, so we're right behind the mountain and there's a reservoir, so it's constantly it's constant filtering flow. water down. So th th this is how unusual it was. I had four or five guys from all around Tromso messaging me on Instagram, where is this flowing river? Where is this flowing river? I just checked my message request there uh, today, and there's like a guy who doesn't even follow me. I don't know how he found me. Uh, and I don't follow him. And it's in my message request. And he says, where is this? I seen you were at this spot. Where is this frozen river? I've tried to find so many. Or, or where is this flowing river? He says, everything else is frozen. And the good thing is, I can tell them till the cows come home. But it's on the private land. It's right mm -hmm. in the garden. Um, but it's it's magic. And it's funny because the of the first Senya trip, we spent the first three days. We did not leave the house once. And it's funny because that's how good the conditions were within an acre, right? The yeah, conditions right. were that good. We didn't have to leave it for sunrise. So what happened was sunrise came, the light came up, was creating these lovely contours of the untouched snow with the trees creating amazing shadows. When sunset came, the sunset was in a place along the river where it was creating mist and you had all these lone trees. And then you had the river itself as lovely foreground interest for background of frozen trees. And then nighttime would fall and all of a sudden you have this unbelievable aurora all over the sky if we walk 500 meters down the road we have a tp and we have three or four of these more of these hexagonal huts all untouched in the complete wilderness not another photographer in sight and that's the beauty of senya it's total wilderness we've seen like three photographers not groups just three photographers well i seen three photographers in the whole two weeks i was on senya and so you know the if this winter wonderland and it's so funny because Aoife Tierney hadn't been there before and she was like after the second day she's like uh, when are we going to the fjords and I'm like <laughs> don't worry we will go to the fjords but trust me these conditions are too good to pass up mm -hmm. so the first three days were spent in the house in the garden and then after that it got a little bit warmer the wind came and all of a sudden you had the snow and ice gone off the trees and everything was bare Mm -hmm. And then she was like, ah, now I get it. And then we went to the fjords and we got all them amazing auroras and stuff and the sunsets. So that's the kind of beauty about it. And, you know, uh, what is it? Carpe diem, seize the day, isn't that it? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And literally it was seize the three days at the house. Mm -hmm. Um, It was magic. So then 
if we move on to the second Senya trip, so the guys had gone home, I brought the new group out, it started the opposite. It was like three days. Now, we had, with Ad, 80's group, we had Aurora every single night. But with the when the second group arrived, they had been like, oh, my God, we've seen the last trip, the conditions they got. My God, we were so jealous. We wish you were on that trip, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Now, the first morning, right, the, in terms of landscape, the light was unreal. The first morning, big red sky, two amazing isolated cabins, patterns in the snow, the best conditions you'll ever get for a sunrise. But the forecast wasn't looking as promising for Aurora, right? And the first three nights, absolutely nothing, right? It just wasn't happening, um, no matter where, all over northern Norway was really bad. So um, there was nothing we could do. So they were getting a bit apprehensive then. So then on the fourth night of the second trip, right, which I would have been four weeks in at this stage, mm -hmm. they were in the middle of making fajitas for dinner. This is only like five o'clock, sunset, literally an hour before that. Right. And... They, as far as I knew and they knew, it was like, no, nah, nothing happening tonight. And then I just had a quick chat with Adrian, Adrian Maudui. And Adrian said, I'm going to try here. Chances are small, but try. And I was like, you know what? If he's going to try that, I'm going to try. I was like, right, when w will I meet you there? He says, right, how long will it take you? So I says, three hours for me to get there. And he said, okay, I'm an hour and a half away. Now, this it was only a small pocket of clearance, right? A small pocket of clearance. And I said to the guys, right, guys, forget dinner. Stop everything, ready in five, go. And they're like, what? What? Like, can we have dinner first? I was like, no, nope, no time for dinner. Go, get ready. We're gone. We'll mm -hmm. stop at a garage really quick. You can get whatever you want there. But we have a long drive ahead of us. So basically, three hours in, um, like, blizzard, white out conditions, wind, snow, sideways snow, trucks then, because it's nighttime, there's more trucks on the road. Every time a truck passes, you're literally blind for five seconds. Like, you're questioning everything. This mm -hmm. is not even an exaggeration. If you go back and look at my Instagram highlights, this is not an exaggeration. So three hours in this, it was catastrophic, right? So anyway, within, we got three hours driving. We got to where we wanted to go. And Adrian, we met Adrian there. And, you know, we're chatting. And, you know, we're hoping this clearance is going to come within a few hours. Anyway, of saying it's going to come in a few hours, it just came. Right now, take into consideration when we were at this really windy viewpoint on the previous trip with Eddie, Hannah, Key, and Aoife, and Tony. That was the best aurora I'd, I'd ever seen, and I'd seen aurora 50, 60 times. That was the best I'd ever seen. Never in a million years did I expect driving three hours that night for a probably 5% chance of clear skies, only for it to clear for about three hours. Never in a million years did I think I would see the best aurora I've ever seen on that night. Wow. It was just mind blown, and the caption of that night was, "Adrian was saying and I caught this on video, and Adrian's like, oh my god, we've got red for the naked eye.'" And then I looked up in the sky and I seen the red, and as soon as he said, "Oh, we have red with the naked eye," I was like, "Red with the naked eye!" <laughs> and like it was just unreal, like it was out of this world, and it made everything worthwhile. You've got all these like you know these. People did probably, you know, three days in, didn't think they would get it or whatever. Anyway, we got it, and it was just unbelievable. Little did we know, the last two nights, um, so, you know, we two nights left after that. Again, three-hour drive home. We had, like, nine kilometers of, this is no joke, nine kilometers of about nine, ten inches of snow on the road. Hadn't been plowed because it was a back road down to our, our, our house. So driving through literally ten, nine, ten inches of snow all the way, hoping that you wouldn't stop or get stuck. And, you know, we got back or whatever. Little did we think then the next two nights we wouldn't have to leave the house again. And the Aurora just got better and better and better. And it was out of this world. And we were back in the temperatures then of minus 20, minus 25 for the last few days. And wow. it made that winter experience for them then. Um, so it was, the memories are just unreal. Um, the, you know, enthusiasm of everyone, everyone's just, going crazy and you've like some of them are close to tears and you know like there was one stage actually where we where we did that drive for three hours and mark um he was there it, it was just going crazy it was going absolutely crazy and for some reason mark who was on the second trip he decided to take out his phone but he obviously didn't realize that when he pressed record the light of the phone came on and i was right. one side and jillian was the other side and 
I, I just felt so sorry for him. We were just like, turn off the light. And she actually was like nearly baiting him. I was like grabbing the phone off and to put it in my pocket to get rid of the light. And he was just like stuck in the middle of the two of us. and <laughs> didn't know what to do. Wow. And after, after he was like, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> but, but then again, like again, so like I, I'm going to play something right now. I don't know if this is going to play right. It, I'll play it into the mic and I hope that it's going to be, um, I hope it's going to be uh, loud. Right. But this was, uh, this was that time. So this is part of the video um, that Adrian play, played. And he's like, oh, red with the naked eye. Right. So hold on now. This is red with the naked eye. Red with the naked eye. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know if that came true. Um, it did, yeah. Yeah. So, like, it was crazy and everyone going crazy and the adrenaline and the enthusiasm of everyone. We knew we weren't going to get back that night till about four in the morning, five in the morning. And the best thing, best part about it was it meant I could get a lie on as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It had been pretty intense five weeks, but it was a great way to finish up. You know, it's, you know, five weeks away. You know, the last few days are when your adrenaline should be at its lowest, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, little did I know that it would be picked right back up and we'd end the trip on such a high that, you know, you almost don't want to leave. You don't want to leave, but you also want to get home as well, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Eddie, which leads me to the question, was it a trip of a lifetime? Yeah, it, um, I definitely think it was. It from from probably a lot of standpoints, probably the main thing for me was, we talked about it earlier, was just you know, coming away from this COVID scenario where we haven't travelled for two years and to do so is wrong and that mindset. Um so yeah, it was it was very good from that point of view. Um the Just conditions like the doctor ordered. Yep. Yeah. The conditions, yeah, I've never experienced anything like it. Um I thought we'd experienced some cold conditions before, but you know, this was just another level, uh, minus thirty. And that really made the trip. It really made it special. It really made it stand out. And um, those winter wonderland conditions, as Bernard said, just at the bottom of the garden, and now have Adrian there and capture that, you know, the way that he can in such a professional way. And to know that you can always look at his video um, and remind yourself that we were there. That was that morning. And in fairness, I've had a few very memorable times with Mr. Bernard Gerdy and. Um, I hope that that will continue in the future. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely um, a trip of a lifetime. I think anybody would have been <laughs> more than happy to have been on this trip. Um, but I said to Bernard that um, Senya is a really, um, I don't know what the right word describes Senya as a place. When you've been to Lofoten and you go to Senya, it's like, is this Norway still? It, it is Norway because you've got the mountains, the fjords, but from a landscape photography point of view, it's like two totally different genres almost. You know, you really have to tune in when you're in Senya. Whereas Lofoten, the shots just popping out everywhere. I mean, if you can't shoot something in Lofoten, just give it up. Um, but Senya, you do have to work on it. And in fairness, um, you did say about snow patterns and that. And again, again, it's just I'm not tuned in haven't been tuned in for the last two years with landscape photography. And I remember shooting again, Bernard tickets um, parked at the side of the road, went down into this field and Bernard said, Dick, there's snow, gummy snow patterns down here beside these red cabins. And I'm going, sure, just shoot it with the 70 to 200 burner. Why are we going into the field? No, 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 trust me, trust me. Damn, the snow patterns down here, you're not going to get it. And um, we followed him in and um, I was shooting into the sun. Um, and Bernard, of course, just automatically goes in the opposite direction. And he's shooting and shouting over at me, do you know, if you got your 12 mil with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get over here now. So I go over to where Bernard is and just straight away, you just see what he's shooting. And it's just, yeah, snow, as you said, darn, just these amazing patterns in the snow that he just seems <laughs> to be like a bloodhound. He can just track these things. And I said to him afterwards, like, what brought you over there? Well, the sun was in that direction. You wanted to get your back to the sun. You wanted to do this. You wanted to do that. You know, blah, blah, blah. And it's going, yeah, well, that's the difference. I mean, yeah, I would consider myself tuned in to landscape photography, but I definitely was not in the zone on this trip. And mm -hmm. Bernard mm -hmm. just, you know, really got me back into it again and got me the enthusiasm. And, you know, 
that's what they're just getting your mojo back really that's what it felt like this trip and what a trip yeah. to be able to do it on and with um bernard again it's just always a pleasure i think as well i think you know um when you're talking about the 12 mil lens there i think it's important to know like that you know what that 12 mil lens can do you know and i think you kind of learned as you went along that okay this 12 mil isn't necessarily to get the extra bit of mountain in it's actually more or less to get better foreground, foreground um yeah. allowing you to play and and we had this as i say the sun wasn't necessarily at our back it was kind of coming from the side maybe you know maybe even 45 degrees and it was it was just like we had these patterns going towards these lovely um cabins but because the sun was coming from the side it was it was like light on one side of the pattern and dark yeah. on the other you and it's contrast it's, yeah dodge and burn porn is what i would call that you know mm-hmm. um but you know one of the best parts of the trip was we we, we went off one day and uh, I said to Adrian, how do we, I said, are you coming with us? And he goes, no, I'm going to do a bit of shooting around the garden. And anyway, we came back a couple of hours later and I walked into the house and all year, you know, he was fucking listening to Irish, uh, Irish trad music. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, he loves tra- Irish trad music. So we're really, really trying to get him across maybe in the summer. Um, maybe rent a, a house out in, in, in Connemara, for, Connemara for four or five days and bring them and give them kind of a real kind of traditional Irish, you know, experience, Authentic get them out for a few points. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which will be different for him. Um, but it's just, it was just unbelievable. You know, the trips were just, it was like, and, and I didn't feel exhausted coming back from them, you know? Um, I, I, you were energized, I, I imagine, because of the whole thing you experienced and the people, as you said as well, you know, so. Well, I, I'm very lucky. I had a few people. So I was suppo- I came home on the Sunday night and on the Tuesday I was supposed to fly to Slovenia and actually only come back today, right? Um, but I had actually contacted the group. It was a private group. And I said, listen, guys, do you mind if we postpone this? I just want to give myself time to recharge. I honestly didn't expect all these Norway trips to go forward, if I'm honest, you know. Um, I, I expected maybe two of them to go ahead, but I maybe didn't expect the first couple. And they said, no, we can postpone, no problem. You know, we understand. And thanks for being open and honest with us. So, like, that gave me extra time to recuperate now for a couple of days' time going to Scotland, you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because you do need that break. And I think pre-COVID, I definitely would have been like, go, 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 go. But you have to take time to yourself. And, mm-hmm. and like, I think AD's really appreciated, okay, COVID's been here. You might lose your mojo or lose your enthusiasm, but you get it back. But also you need to respect yourself when you don't want to shoot with the camera. Don't force yourself to shoot with the camera. Um, take that break when you can. And we spoke about this weekend. We had Storm Franklin and Eunice and Dudley and myself and Eddie talked numerous times about it. But now, luckily, the best swell was in the middle of the night, too. But I just had so much little things to do that I'm, I'm glad I didn't go and shoot them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I just don't, it, it couldn't justify driving all the way across, you know, for probably shots I've had already, you know, that kind of way. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. think you do have to take a step back and, and realize, number one, if you've lost that little bit of enthusiasm, is it takes time to get back. But also, when you get it back, don't go hell for letter. Don't wear yourself out. Don't burn yourself out. Just everything in moderation, you know. Yeah, look, I mean, it's like recharging your batteries and then putting your foot all the way down fully on the pedal and the battery is gone again so quickly. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Bugatti Veyron is a phenomenal car, but flat out you'll go through a tank of gas in a short period of time. You know, enjoy the ride. You don't have to go from zero to 200 miles an hour all the time, like, you know. Um, and speaking of going zero to 200 miles an hour, people get to get multiple flights to be able to get over, obviously, to, uh, to, to, to Norway. So you're booked out for 2023, but people can go in 2024, can they? Uh, yeah, I've booked Lofoten. Yeah, I've my two Lofoten trips for 2023 are sold out. Um, I have actually just literally tonight added a second Senya one um, with just one spot left already, and it's not been advertised yet, but that's probably, I hope, will be sold by the time this goes out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, and, and this is it too. Like, I'm, I'm going to start really slowing down. I, I have play- ways in which I re- want to restructure my business that I'm not traveling 24-7, 365 all that kind of stuff i want to start spending more time at home you know working on friendships relationships um family time dog mm-hmm. time all that kind of stuff um so like it's it's going to become less and less and my 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 kind of concentration is going to work on bringing people into ireland i'll still mm-hmm. do the traveling but the trips will be more limited um so kind of next year is the last big year of of, of these big trips um you know being 
you know, more frequent, if you know what I mean. It'll gotcha. probably just be one in North, one in Senya, one in the Fort, one in Scotland, one in Slovenia, instead of two, 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 you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, things are going really well. Uh, busy, busy year ahead. Um, you know, Scotland coming up this week, Iceland the week after, a couple of weeks back in Ireland, Iceland again. So it's uh, it's going to be busy, um, but it's amazing how quick, you know, we're nearly in March already, you know. Nearly, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, AD, from your point of view now, I mean, what's next for you? Have you another trip booked? Are you going to uh, give a breath a break for a bit? Or are you going to go, do you know what? No, nah, I'm going again. Um, you need to ask Mr. Gurdy about that. Um, yeah, we've quite a few <laughs> trips booked. Um, Brilliant. Quite a, quite a few um, amazing locations that we're hoping to get to. Um, we missed quite a few over the last two years that we had pre-booked with Bernard. Um, one was a trip to Botswana and, and Namib, um, nice. which was going to be um, a wedding anniversary present to ourselves, myself and Hannah. Um, and that was going to be really something special. So we're looking forward to trying to fit that in and we were just in a group message with the other guy who's going on that this evening. So hopefully Flo, we can, Flo, Flo and again, I don't, I, oh, I, Flo, I don't, yeah, 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 Flo, yeah, who, um, yeah, he seems like a real character. Um, so yeah, at the same time, I don't want to be putting Bernard under pressure. I said that to him already. He's got enough going on. Um, when we get there, we get there. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice to do that. I think we've Patagonia on the list as well. New Zealand was on the list. Um, and then, Tony, who we're, we're friendly with, was on the trip with us again, this time um, in Norway. And she brought up about going to Svalbard again because we'd mentioned it the last time we were in Norway. And um, yeah, I've made inquiries about that. And Bernard's helped me with that too. So nice. we're maybe going to see about doing that in 2014 or 2014. Going <laughs> back in time. In time. Back to the future. <laughs> Michael J. Fox. <laughs> 2024. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Brilliant. So. Yeah, well, do you know that's, what? That's the plans, yeah. Make, make up for last time, you know, and it's always have good to have something to look forward to as well, I think. You know, that's the most important part, really, because I think the whole COVID side of things, you had nothing to look forward to except that the day that this would end. And now we've got something that we can look forward to, you know, from a next trip and then a May trip after that. So at least you're always kind of pushing on. I think that's a good way to be able to uh, to, to spend the time. Um, Guys, speaking of time, I think we're running out of it. I think I've had a phenomenal insight to what seemed like an absolutely incredible incredible trip for you anyway AD in the period of time that you were there but also for you Bernard having them you know back to back absolute incredible thank you both for coming on and for uh, sharing your stories it was fascinating for me and more jealous again to me of not getting to the Fulton you know but yeah maybe someday you maybe get there someday, someday Dorn. yeah maybe someday yeah look guys thanks a million it's been a, a phenomenal chat Eddie. yeah thank you easy yeah thank you thanks everybody and uh yeah just long before hey guys if you dig what you're hearing why don't you jump over to itunes spotify or wherever you get your podcasts give us a five star rating and don't forget to share with your friends with all that done we'll see you next week and remember keep shooting